Hi, Instagram. It's me, Sin, and I'm here with my friend, Ellen. Ellen, introduce yourself to Instagram really quick. Hi, I'm Ellen Melchiondo. <laughs> so Ellen is basically, I know Ellen through a lot of the inmates, prisoners, right, at SCI Muncie, which she helped for many, many years. But we formally met during a program that she brought to the prison called Community Capacity Building, right? Right. So what, what inspired you to come to SCI Muncie? Well, originally I went there to meet a specific person um, named Sharon Wiggins, and that was back in 2011. And explain to Instagram who Sharon Wiggins was. Sharon Wiggins was originally sentenced to death in 1968 from a bank robbery that she participated in um, sometime around 1970. Um, her and her two co-defendants were, um, had, well, they had their sentence commuted to life without parole, but they were all juveniles at the time. Wow, that's pretty, pretty deep. So, um... Basically, like, what I want to know is, like, for a person who, you've never been locked up, have you? No, never. Okay, so how, how is it that you can manage your normal life and still want to help people on the inside? Um, I kind of, I guess the, just my general principles, I suppose, uh, don't really change. I mean, I, I, I live my life and I parent and, and, um, as as straightforward and honest as I possibly can. So there really is no, I've never really had to transition. Okay, so when you first met um, Sharon Wiggins, as we know in the prison, Peachy, right? She introduced you to prison society and why did she do that? So when I agreed to meet her in person after we had been writing for about a year, um, I went to Muncie to visit her and we got along fabulously. And after a couple of more visits, she asked me if I would be willing to meet a couple of her good friends, her best friends, actually. And in order for me to do that, I would have to become an official visitor with the Pennsylvania Prison Society, which would allow me to visit multiple people. And so that's what I did. So really quick. So Prison Society does what? Prison Society was, was created to basically monitor conditions of confinement. And, and the Prison Society still does that as their core mission. And uh, what, is their, what is the number one complaint to Prison Society? Our, our I guess what we, we hear the most about is um, the, the poor medical treatment. And when you say that, you mean like uh, them neglecting people or letting people die of things that they could be prevented? Yes, a lot of, a lot of um, health problems that, that go untreated or, or just ignored. Yes, and I can tell you from someone who was in prison that there was times, you know, I went to medical and they basically thought that I wanted drugs, you mm -hmm. know, because I was a convicted murderer. I was judged uh, mm -hmm. all the way through. And um, for that, I thank you for coming to the prisons. And, and the prison loves you. Your name rings a lot of bells. I don't know if you know that. But um, so, okay, so you met Peachy, right? And mm -hmm. you guys, um, you also assist in commutations, right? Explain to Instagram briefly what is commutation and, and why do you do that? Why is it so important? Well, for lifers, after they've exhausted all their appeals, commutation is their, is their only means of, of release. And so Sharon Wiggins asked me if I would help her. And so we filed her 13th commutation in mm -hmm. 2012. Um, but she died in 2013 in her cell at Muncie. So her application didn't go anywhere. Wow, I'm sorry. I know you were very close to her and she was very close to you. And um, uh, for, for somebody who was on the inside, uh, somebody like you, um, I don't know if you know this, but you offer a lot of, you know, light to us in there when, you know, we are away from our families, when we don't have people that really care about us, the courts deny all of our stuff. And it's people like you who just come up and say, you know what? I'll make the calls right? or I'll write the papers or I'll do the research. And that takes a lot of freaking time. And, you know, I just want you to know that like your work in this world will always be remembered by people like us who society has casted away. And we really love you for that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. you know, there's, there's sort of a, there's a lot of nuance and, you know, there's a, there's certain ways where we have to, you know, conduct ourselves to be effective advocates. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing with oftentimes a very hostile leadership. And, and 
we don't want to sabotage access but at the same time, we need to be very critical and hold people to accountability. Mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, my, my advocacy um, can be very challenged. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very diplomatic. Yes. Um, and, and, and sometimes we, we hit roadblocks. Sometimes we're successful and sometimes we're not. Yeah. So, so from knowing you by other inmates, right, and the work that you do, what I heard about you is that you are somebody who fights for injustices. Right. And you fight very hard. And sometimes, like you said, um, a lot of times prison officials don't like that. Right. So you have to not kind of like ride the fence, but you have to be careful in what you say when really you want to say, you know, something else. You know? Right. So so you hold your composure and in doing so, you do it in the interest of the person who is incarcerated. Of right? course. Absolutely. Of course. Yeah. So explain to Instagram, like, um, is this conversation happen very often and. And why is it so unfair and why do you think it happens that way? Well, I mean, there's no doubt about it that the whole commutation process is political. Mm -hmm. So you could say these prisoners are political prisoners yes, um, because the board changes and they're all elected or they're appointed and they all have their own special agendas. Mm -hmm. um, they often use that position to further their careers. You know, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman is not even considering a run for you know the governorship of Pennsylvania. He just wants to go straight to D.C. for the U.S. Senate. There's a guy that is completely jumping the system, you know, and I mm. I think that's really unfortunate. So the commutation process, you know, from the very beginning of getting the application, you know, to say the merit review takes about two years. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, once you have a merit review, if you get three out of five votes, you go on to a public hearing and that happens about a month later. And then you have to get unanimous votes to have your uh, application move on to the governor. So let me let me tell you this, right? As somebody who was in prison, right? Obviously, I won my federal appeal, but um, before I won my federal appeal, I really thought that I was going to lose because Pennsylvania is a horrible conservative state that doesn't really believe in too much change. I often struggled with the reality of how do I confess to something that I physically didn't do, right? So, like, what what would you say to Instagram about that, like, or or to inmates right now that are considering, you know? filing for commutation because they have just been denied, but they really didn't commit the crime. That's like a horrible situation. Well, I don't get very many requests mm -hmm. for assistance to write commutation applications for women who claim innocence, mm -hmm. but I encourage them all the time mm -hmm. to file. And what I expect them to write mm -hmm. in, in section three of the application, which wants to know what is your role in the crime you know, what did you do and how were you arrested? So if they can't write that they committed the actual crime, then write about where were they during that situation mm -hmm. that got them arrested and convicted and sentenced to life without parole. Then they always talk about, well, I can't feel remorse for a crime that occurred that I'm not responsible for and, you know, on one hand, I say, well, if you knew the person who died, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the, you feel something about their life being ended that way. Um, but there is no mechanism within the Board of Pardons to process these innocent claims. However, there is one case coming up this week of a man who claimed innocence, and he did get to a public hearing. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how that happens. But like I said, all the applications that I've assisted, which might be about 30, mm -hmm. um, none of them claimed innocence. Wow. So I can tell you that it took me about, I would probably say like eight years before I started to realize like, wow, like even though I didn't physically kill somebody, my irresponsible addiction to pills, you know, led me to that park. And, you know, it was, it took me a long time because like you said, I couldn't really feel remorse when I didn't physically commit the act. Mm -hmm. But um, I get exactly what you're saying. It's kind of taking responsibility for, you know, even if it was on emotional, you know, on emotional level or issues that you didn't deal with like myself. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm, so I get mm -hmm, exactly what you're mm -hmm, saying. Mm -hmm. um, 
um, doing this work, like, um, and seeing so many injustices, like, what do you think about Pennsylvania? And how do you think that we need to move away from being so harsh? Well, I have found that in general, the public is really super ignorant about what is happening in corrections. Mm -hmm. And um, like I thought a few years ago, you know, every household should get delivered to their house, um, a, a Department of Corrections um, budget mm -hmm. and population report. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that everybody knows in Pennsylvania who's being locked up mm -hmm. at from what age, at what race, um, you know, male or female, transgender, whatever, what their conviction was, what their sentence was, um, and, and maybe even some programming, like what's happening with these individuals. I think the more Pennsylvanians know about who they are locking up for life should give them the information to say, hold up. We need a moratorium on who we are putting in prison. So basically what you're saying is that the public has a lot of power? The public has a lot of power, but they just don't want to do their homework to know what's going on. When they see that the budget keeps getting higher, the population's getting lower, crime rates are going lower, well, what's going on here? And it turns out that a lot of the budget increases with the Department of Corrections is settling lawsuits mm. and pensions. None of the budget increases impacts the quality of life of prisoners. Wow. So um, I get a lot of, uh, sometimes when I post things on Instagram, I will get comments such as like, well, did they commit murder, right? Um, as for people that are in the public and sometimes they're skeptical about people in prison, like people like me and you, which will be considered abolitionists, right? They, they automatically jump to the, what did they do? Right. They commit murder, right? right. Um, what we are saying basically is that, you know, people should be held accountable for the things that they do. However, people can change, right? Um, science proves that. And um, locking people up in penitentiaries doesn't really help people, right? Right. So what would you say to people that, you know, the public that say, you know what, I'm not going to do the research because they committed a crime. What would you say to them to get them to change their mind? Well, I'd ask them if they vote, you know, <laughs> um, and I, I think ultimately, you know, what should be happening is people need to be healed. Mm -hmm. Trauma needs to be healed. Mm -hmm. Families need to be reunited. And, you know, the best part of my work being an advocate is seeing these lives restored, wow. seeing families coming back together and, wow. and, you know, experiencing all the roller coaster of that. And, you know, it's just amazing that when I see, you know, lifers or long termers coming out, um, almost like the day after, they physically change, their health improves. It happened to me. I mean, it's, it's just remarkable. It the is. oppressive system mm -hmm. is so dangerous mm -hmm. down into the the DNA. Okay, so I'm going to play devil's advocate. Right? Okay. Like, right? So we we fight for people who are in prison, right? And we have a lot of people that are victims and they have been victimized by people that were in prison. Um, we, how do we bring us together? How do we heal? Because sending people to prison really doesn't bring healing to families, right? Yeah. So having somebody released from, from prison doesn't also bring back a victim, right? How do we kind of tell the victim, hey, you know, like we understand what we did, but we're still fighting to get these people out? What would you say to that? Well, I have found that the system, even through like the Office of Victim Advocate, mm -hmm. um, doesn't embrace any type of restorative justice. Mm -hmm. it, it, in fact, it, it, it creates hurdles for mm -hmm. that to happen. And the only way that we are going to face the darkest days of our lives, mm -hmm. you know, and if we want to be well, you mm -hmm. know, ourselves emotionally or spiritually, um, we have to be courageous mm -hmm. and take that step and start a dialogue. Because I have been in contact with victims mm -hmm. 
And through generations, because a lot of these people have been in prison for 40, 50 years, so we're talking now grandchildren, mm -hmm. um, you know, the information that they're provided is often wrong. Mm -hmm. Myths are created. Mm -hmm. People are demonized to the worst level you could possibly imagine. And, and yet they're very, very close-minded to get any kind of new information that would help them heal. That's so true. So, you know, I don't have the answer for that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if people want to hold on to grudges mm -hmm. that, that are unhealthy, mm -hmm. um, that prevent them from building their own life, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately we're responsible for ourselves. So and if they're not going to take that responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, you can't force somebody to forgive. Mm -hmm. You can't force somebody to say, yeah, you know what, maybe what I heard about this that happened 40 years ago, you know, maybe I need to look at that. Maybe this, these stories aren't accurate. Mm -hmm. May, or maybe the system back then was set up that because of the the racism and the policing and the mm -hmm. and the poor educational system um that created this this cycle you know you, you have to do the work yeah so so basically i what i want to like basically what i'm hearing you say is that i know for me that when i feel when i think more positive i feel happy right when i have more compassion i feel more energetic right and people have wronged me and it's not my job to hold revenge and it's not my job to see what happens to them right i believe in you know the laws of physics i believe in god i believe in you know the vengeance is not mine so what basically you're saying is to really heal is, is to kind of let go, but not to forget, right? Kind of yeah, sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And right. often, often it's it's you know in 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 this situation, you need the information, you need mm -hmm. the facts, um, but you also have to have the open heart and mm -hmm. the open mind to to want to take that risk and 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 find out, you know. What is the root of the trauma that is holding my family down? Yes, and and one of my favorite quotes that I often told people in prison was, "In order to know blue, you must know green and yellow." Right. 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 So, right, with that right. being said, um, tell Instagram something about a Sharon Wiggins that that you love so much, and and how she changed your life, and how she affected you so deeply. Because I know you really truly loved her, and she she literally does so much work for her, even though she's not here in the physical form and and i'm sure she's probably watching tell instagram what what she meant to you um sharon wiggins was a very honest forthright woman um with like incredible integrity um she was smart mm -hmm. she she fought for better confinement treatment um for women like um she for example, fought to have the law library put in place at Muncie. Mm -hmm. um, so she was really about empowering other women. She was, you know, she was a reader. Um, she she was a feminist. Um, you know, one of her sort of claim to fames, for me at least, is she was employed mm -hmm. by Penn State University to administer the education program there. And in order for her to do that and get a, a paycheck, mm -hmm. she had to pay for her room and board, her <laughs> cell and her chow. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Swear to God. And she did. Wow. She did. Um, and that position ended when that program was cut. So she was never fired. The program was cut. Yeah. So, you know, it's very tragic that, you know, after Miller v. Alabama was resolved, that mandatory life sentence for juveniles was unconstitutional. And that's why she was at Muncie. Um, she died because Pennsylvania didn't want to make that 
ruling retroactive. Yeah, I remember. So that. she died in her cell in 2013. Yes. Yeah. So basically, I want to thank you on the behalf of Chi-Chi. I want to thank you on the behalf of all of the lifers. You may not know this, but you bring a lot of joy to us. The little, the emails, mm -hmm. the information, the visits, you know, when we complain to you about not having tissue, mm -hmm. you know, you always respond. And, and, and I love you for that. I really, really do. That's yes. why I'm in your home. <laughs> and I want to leave Instagram, but I want you to tell Instagram a message. If you want to, for somebody to change the way that they think about people in prison and forgiveness, what would you tell to Instagram? Um... I mean, I think you fundamentally have to get in touch with your own humanity. Mm -hmm. um, people aren't perfect. People change. Um, recognize your own possibly, you know, privilege um, that others didn't have. And um, just extend a sense of kindness and compassion and just to keep your mind open because who you are judging is most likely an injustice. So true. Yeah. Thank you so much. I want to give you a hug for <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> we love you, Instagram. <laughs> Say bye to Instagram. See you later. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> bye.